Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I find it kind of interesting that people uh, have talked to me about interesting acoustics. You will have all got in your pack a book of mine about the most amazing sounds in the world. And I'm always struck by how some of the places people say, oh, it's got the most marvellous acoustics, are actually, from a design point of view, rather poor. And uh, I, I'm going to start with a place which I just read what I took off Wikipedia this morning, but you can get it in travel guides as well. The building has an international reputation as one of the most acoustically perfect buildings in the world. That's a pretty high sort of kind of bar to set, isn't it? So I wonder if you know where that might be. Any thoughts? It's going to, uh, participation. Go on, shout out. Taj Mahal. Your bedroom. I do get right. Can we turn the next 30 minutes over to hearing about your bedroom? <laughs> okay, um, I'll give you a clue. Um, we'll let's skip past that. It's in that book, so it's old. So, I uh, collected papers for those who are not in acoustics. Okay, so being the absolute grandfather of architectural acoustics, he's collected papers published uh, sort of early 19th, 20th century, sorry. Um, has a whole chapter on whispering galleries at the end, sort of, a, uh, sort of peculiar acoustics. And um, I used this to source stuff which went into my book, but there was a place in there that I never, it isn't in the book, but I visited this summer. And it's this acoustically perfect building, and it's this place. So, it's the Mormon Tabernacle in Salt Lake City. And it's, an, it's a building which was built um, by a bridge builder. And you can tell from its construction, it's got this nice big arch. It wasn't built by an architect, so all the architects in the room can be safe for the moment. It was a bridge builder who made this. Um, and it has the very famous Tabernacle Choir who, who sing in it. And what's interesting is there's not many places in the world where you go as a tourist and they give you an acoustic demonstration. But when you go here, they'll actually demonstrate the acoustics to you. And uh, they did it to me as well. So what makes it interesting is a big space like this, it's a big single space, obviously a lot bigger than this, but it's got an elliptical roof, and that's what gives it the acoustic properties that are so famed. And uh, elliptical roofs have been known about for a long time. This is the earliest drawing I've managed to find. This is a 17th century Jesuit scholar called Antheus Kircher, who is a great person to look up. He had all sorts of fantastical things. I think the most famous is probably the cat piano, which basically tortures cats to make music. Um, but anyway, uh, this is his drawing from uh, one, of his, uh, one of his famous works. And if you have an elliptical roof, if I'm, say, stood at one focus, and let's say the cameraman's at another, everything that goes up to the ceiling goes to the other focal point. So you get very great amplification across the room. And uh, if you want to demonstrate this, you can put this picture up, but you can also demonstrate it using a snooker table. And recently, someone has built an elliptical snooker table in Britain. His name's Alex Bellos. He writes uh, popular science books. And uh, if you sit at one focus of the snooker table and hit the cue ball, then it, the ball always goes into the pocket, which is in the middle. So it must be a very boring game, really. I mean, it's just like he can't fail to score, but he's made this elliptical snooker table. So it's all focusing. It's all kind of very simple kind of physical principles. And it's been known about as he's, ever since it's built, apparently. And so if we go back to 1930s, this is a Journal of Acoustic Society of America. Even here, you know, we're doing tours. So this is a, a, a description of tour guides conclude their tour by giving them a demonstration of some of its acoustic properties. An attendant drops an iPad on a wooden rail. <laughs> it drops it in his stiff hat. He rubs his hands and whispers. And towards and away from the visitors who are in the balcony at the rear of the building, nearly 200 feet away. All of these demonstrations are heard distinctly. The result is that the Mormon tabernacle has a very extended reputation of being one of the most acoustically perfect buildings in the world. Wikipedia doesn't have anything which isn't stolen from elsewhere. There's the phrase yet again. So... It has got this reputation, and they demonstrated it to me. They did ripping of paper, and they dropped pins, and they talked and stuff. Unfortunately, the tour guides there, or the sisters, they should be probably better called, um, didn't realise that you, you have to be in the balcony to be at the other focal point, so they don't actually tell you where to stand, which is a bit of a shame. But I was near enough that I could hear, yes, the sound travels quite well, and, um, and, it, and it has this focusing effect. But that's kind of surprising, because actually, if you think about, if you and an acoustic consultant and architect came up and said, I'm going to put an elliptical ceiling on, alarm bells would start ringing, wouldn't they? You'd start to panic, think, oh no, this is going to be a disaster. Because we all know that 
you get this perfect transmission between two points, but that means the rest of the room is suffering. It hasn't got the sound that is being funneled to this marvellous, fortunate listener stuck at this one position. So actually, is this acoustically perfect? It's remarkable, but I say it's got a defect. Uh, Sarah Rollins, who um, is a cons consultant, I don't know, across in America, but did a, a, a thesis on this for Brigham Young University, and I stole this off the internet. Um, here's some ease modelling, computer model for focusing. Well, not maybe the best sort of method, but it was some data I had. And what happens if you're on the stage... I need a point here. Is there a point on this? No, I'll use my very... Up there, middle of the stage, you can see there's a focal point right in the balcony. And here is the actual impulse response at the balcony. Here's the direct sound. And here's the, all the reflections, the focuses, and you can see they're sort of like 20 dB higher. So you must get not only, you must get a very strong sound, you must almost get things like image shift and some other factors as well. She didn't just do predictions, she also did measurements. And she's got a variety of parameters she measured in the space. Um, but I just pick on this particular one, just early decay time, just being a sense of reverberance. The thing about a room which has got a focusing ceiling is the acoustics are going to be uneven. So all the parameters are uneven in this room, and I just picked early decay time as an example. So if you look, it's got a, um, there's a seating on the stalls, the round thing around the edges of the balcony. You've got the, uh, the organ and the choir at the top where it's dark blue. So on the stage, the early decay time is short, as you might imagine. The sound decays quickly. It's all about really direct sound. A long way away, you get a longer decay, but you can also see effects of focusing where you have very great differences. You move around this balcony, you can go from an early decay time of about two seconds up to about 10 seconds just by wandering not many seats away. So the acoustics is very, very variable in those, that place. So this, to me, doesn't sound to me like the acoustic perfect building. It sounds to me actually like a slightly flawed building. So it's interesting, isn't it? The acoustic defects that are quite famed and celebrated, actually, are things as designers we'd like to avoid. And uh, that sort of kind of led to uh, one uh, modernist architect, not the, my thought, but uh, a modernist architect looking to try and get this to work for more people. So Alva Aalto, who um, I suppose is very famous in Scandinavia, uh, very famous worldwide as well, tried to take the principle that we saw in that Kircher picture and extend it from not one to one person, but one to many people. So he drew this diagram. There's a few different versions of this around where here's the speaker, and he's trying to get all the ray paths, all the kind of different reflection paths, to cover all the audience along the uh, along this uh, uh, library, which you can visit. I think it's now in Russia. I think it used to be in Finland, but it now might be a bit, a bit of Russia. Um, and I saw a paper on this, and someone said, oh, he was a, what a marvellous acoustic idea. And I was thinking, is this? I mean, I work in concert hall acoustics, and if you have ribs in the concert hall and the ceiling going that way, it's bad news. So I was thinking, this must be bad news. So I did some prediction modelling on it. So on the left-hand side, on the top, you can see a source. You can see all the pink or magenta receivers. And the black line is literally where I trace the shape of the ceiling into my model. And um, I, what I would anticipate happening is if you have it like in this like a nice flat ceiling. As I taught you, everything that goes that way, ignore the electronics, pretend that's not there. Everything that goes that way is going to go towards the back of the room. And it's people at the back who suffer bad acoustics when we're doing it naturally. Down here at the front, you can hear me well enough, whatever the room is doing, pretty much. It's people at the back who need the sound. As soon as you put ribs in going across the widthways, sound gets scattered back towards the front. It's inevitable. So you get more sound, you're even happier but there's less sound that's going to go to the back. And that's the reason this design is flawed. And this is what my prediction model showed exactly this result. So this is just the reflection of the ceiling as a function of distance, 5 metres to 25 metres from, uh, from the speaker. And this is just level. And you can see, if you go sort of three quarters away back in the library, uh, I haven't described the lines, the red one's a flat ceiling, and the black one is this wiggly ceiling, you can see there's a drop in level because sound which would have gone to the back from a flat ceiling comes back to me at the front, which is actually what we don't want. So unfortunately, it was a great idea, and it inspired a very pretty-looking ceiling, but from an acoustic point of view, again, it's flawed. There we go, another celebrated place which has got, actually, a rather acoustical floor. So I've been trying to collect places like this, and... Um, I met another one when I was last in Scandinavia, when I was in Oslo. So I talked at the Contemporary Music Festival at Oslo. Um, I was promoting my book. And um, I went to the bar afterwards, and someone rushed up to me and said, you must go to where the train goes underground at the American Embassy. So the next day, I was wandering out. I had a day in Oslo. 
to go and look at some sites. And I wandered over to the American Embassy, and there was a railway station. And there's the booking hall at the railway station. Do we have anyone from Oslo here? No one from Norway. God, there we go. Hey, we have one person from Norway. Good, I'm glad we have one. Oh. Um, have you been to this one? You have been to this one. Okay, so this is a booking hall which has the most amazing acoustic in it. And again, it's not in the, the book you got yesterday because this is post right in the book. Um, so I'm going to play you a bit. I recorded in there. I'm going to start by talking on the edge and I'm going to walk into the middle where that pl plaque is and walk out again. And you can hear the acoustics as I walk. And it's basically a cylinder. It's not quite, but it's basically a cylinder. I'm in the booking hall of an Oslo train station and uh, you can just hear me chatting here but as I approach the middle of this space I think you can hear how my voice is suddenly amplified and then distorted by the shape. It's a cylinder and actually if you look at the floor there's a plaque saying acoustic sculpture so it's not an accident it was deliberately designed Quite amazing. I shall wander out again and you'll see and you should be able to hear it disappear. As I got it talking of course for that. But you can hear how the dramatic sound effect is suddenly gone. And it's like I'm in a normal room again. So this is the National Theatre railway station, the entrance near the American Embassy in Oslo. So if you ever go to Oslo, here is a grand tourist site that you can go and visit. It's a great place. Now, I got two things wrong on that description. I did that you know, literally the day after I'd met this guy in the bar. And it, actually, when I got back to England, I found out who the architect was. He very kindly had a conversation with me about the design of this. And he told me two things. The first of all was that it wasn't deliberately designed to sound like that. So what happened was, if you actually look at the plan of it, I can show you a picture of the plan he sent me, which is up there, the right-hand side. It's roughly a cylinder, and he knew there'd be a flutter echo. He knew he'd get that sort of rippling sound, but he didn't realise it would be so bad. And actually, the Norwegian railway company was really not very happy, and they threatened to sue him for his bad design. It was only 40,000 kroner, which I don't think is that much, really, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, a, it's enough, but it's not, it's not a vast sum to be sued for, I guess. Um, but what then happened was a miracle, I guess. Artists found it, sound artists, musicians, and started going there and making recordings. So they stuck a plaque in the middle saying acoustic sculpture, and everyone was happy, and they didn't sue him after all. So here we are. How, that's how to deal when you have an architectural defect, is turn it into a feature. Now, we've all done that probably doing DIY at home, haven't we? We've made a mistake and turned it into a feature. You know, here it is on a grand scale. Um, the second thing I got wrong is it's not quite a cylinder, and that's the reason you get a warbling sound. So I've been in lots of spherical and cylindrical rooms that have the most amazing acoustic, but you just get a very straight sound. But that warble was, is really quite peculiar. And you can hear it if I play a balloon burst in there. I've got three balloon bursts. You can hear it warbling. So it's got a really odd warbling sound to it. And you wouldn't normally get that effect in, a, say, a spherical room or in, a, in a, a room which is pure cylinder. But if you look at the diagram, it's actually, there's a big cylinder outside, but they took a little bit of one side out to make booking offices. So it's actually two cylinders of slightly different sizes, and that's what gives it that warbling sound. Because this is a pointer. This will actually make my life a bit easier. Basically what happens is sound is bouncing back and forth between these two points. And basically you get a short path that way, and a long path that way, but the path to the top, to the bottom, and back to the middle is the same length as the bottom to the top, to the back to the middle. So every third reflection is very loud, and that's what gives the warble. Now, for the acoustics people in the room, I challenge you now to answer this. This is the autocorrelation. If you don't know what this is, don't worry. And this is every fourth one is loud. My explanation isn't quite right, so you can come up to me afterwards and tell me what's wrong. I still haven't worked out what's wrong. But it's the basic principle that every so often a reflection is loud and it's giving you that warbling sound. So if you want to find rooms with defects, anything with a big curved surface, you can find lots of them. And, uh, and hence why our acousticians get very afraid when architects say, oh, I'd like to make an egg-shaped room. Not, it can be work, but it's rather difficult.
Now, there's another kind of thing that happens when people talk about um, the most marvellous acoustics. Oh, marvellous space. Someone said the Taj Mahal, didn't they? Really reverberant spaces are venerated as being amazing. But from a functional point of view, they're a complete and utter disaster, aren't they? So here again, most acoustically marvellous place, from a functional point of view, a complete disaster. And I went hunting for the most reverberant place in the world. And that sort of search started because I visited the world record holder. And this is it. It's the Hamilton Mausoleum in uh, Scotland, which you can visit. It's just outside Glasgow. Well worth visiting. He was a rather egotistical person, the Duke of Hamilton. Hence, this is where he's buried, or was buried, um, in an Egyptian sarcophagus, of all things, you know, brought back from Egypt. You know, he was a bit egotistical. Um, anyway, here is a very famous Danish manufacturer of pro acoustic products, the decahedron loudspeaker. And some measurements were made when I was up there. And um, when I heard it, I was kind of... I knew, I, it was reverberant, but it wasn't that reverberant. And I thought, ah, I bet you I can do better than that. So just to give you a sense... Uh, here's the reverberation time. Now, I heard there's architects and non-acousticians, so I'll explain what this is. And if I'm telling everyone they know this, I apologise. But reverberance is basically the time sound lingers in a room when you stop. So in a cathedral, it's very long. In a bedroom like, or a hotel bedroom, it's very short. Uh, concert hall, we're talking about a couple of seconds. Hamilton Mausoleum, somewhere in the mid-frequencies, it's about 10 seconds, something along that kind of order. Give you a sense of what that would be like if you go to London, go to St. Paul's Cathedral, very big cathedral, Christopher Wren built. Um, that's got a reverberation time about the same at mid-frequency. It's a lot bigger, but it's got a lot of glass and pews that tend to absorb the sound. So it is reverberant, but knowing that St. Paul's Cathedral was similar made me think, well, there must be more reverberant places than that. So I went hunting for them. And actually, one of the places I, I researched but didn't get to visit till later was in Oslo. So for, just for Peter, the only Oslo delegate here, um, here is the Emanuel Viglund Mausoleum. Anyone been to this? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's, there's one, at least one nod. So when you go to Oslo, you'll go to the, uh, the, the Viglund Park, which is where his brother, the brother of this artist, made all the very famous sculptures. This artist here was more famous for doing, um, uh, uh, it was stained glass in, in churches. Which is kind of odd, because actually when you visit his mausoleum, what you can't see, you might be able to see better on these computers on the side, is it's full of frescoes and murals, which cover every aspect of life you can measure from birth to death. So, for example, when you go under the door, if you look behind it, there's a picture of two skeletons having sex and creating a cloud of babies. It's, it's a bit like that all over. So a, it's quite explicit, and it has a warning above it. I can't remember what the warning says, but basically, beware before you go in. Um, so he built this. It was going to be his gallery. He later on filled the w windows in, and then he turned it into his mausoleum. You can visit it. It's not open very often, but it has the most amazing acoustic, and uh, it is well worth visiting. And the reason it, it's very reverberant, it has no windows, it has no, nothing to absorb the sound very much. It's made from very thick concrete, and presumably the paint seals up the concrete as well. So what's the reverberation time in that place? Well, the, blue li the yellow line is the Hamilton Mausoleum, the old world record holder. The blue line is, which is a bit faint in here, but it's kind of up at about 14 seconds at mid-frequencies. It's always hard with these places to know what number to pick because they always have these sort of very dramatic slopes because there's always much more high-frequency absorption. That's air absorption at the top, a lot of it. And at low frequency, it's much more reverberant. But I'm going to pick the middle and say it's about 14 seconds because you talk in there, that's what it sounds like. That's how reverberant it is. But that's not the most reverberant place. There's more reverberant places if you go and look at water reservoirs. So this is one in... Let's look at the picture. This is one in America, uh, in, uh, across in the west coast of America. This is, used to hold, if I remember rightly, a couple of million gallons, that would be US gallons, of course, of uh, water. And um, they empty it, and you can go and do artist re um, sort of residences there and go and record in it. So you'll find there's works that have been recorded in there. You can buy albums which have been recorded in there. I visited one which looked really similar, which was in Scotland. And, um, but the American one is a bit bigger, so it's got the longer reverberation time. And again, it's, it's this odd accidental sort of space. It was built large, presumably because they wanted a lot of water, made out of very solid concrete, sealed, and it has a very long reverberation time. That's the Dan Harpole system, as it's now, it's now called. And you see mid-frequencies, the reverberation time is up. Oh, it's, uh, it depends where you want to draw your line, but it's up near 15, 16 seconds. So when I was writing the book, 
One of the things you're thinking when you're trying to communicate science is what's the narrative. So this forms the narrative of my first chapter of my book. So I've just ruined it for you, apologies. Um, but I then thought, well, you know, is there anything longer? And so I contacted a group called Subterranean Britannica, Underground Britain, the translates as, who like to spend their time sort of going underground. There's also a group called 28 uh, Days Later, which is a bit more subversive. You like to break into places and, uh, and to film them. And all their, if you go on their website, you'll find all their faces are sort of fuzzed out and things so they don't get caught. Um, and I went and asked both those groups if they knew of anywhere that would be worth going to visit. And I was fortunate enough that one person said, you have to go back to Scotland and you have to go and visit the Inch and Down Oil Depot, which had actually, it's very rarely been in, but actually had just been filmed by the BBC. And um, the Inch and Down Oil Depot was built in the run-up to World War II. So if you think of a map of Scotland, it's not quite the top on the right-hand side, it's near Inverness, and it was above the Cromarty Firth. And Cromarty Firth used to have the naval, one of the naval shipping uh, areas in it, and they had oil, obviously, to service the ship, and they were worried that the Germans would bomb the oil supplies. So what do you do? You bury your oil depots into the side of a hill. So they literally tunnelled this out of a hill, and if you went and visited it now, if you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't see any sign of it. And in fact, it, the interesting thing is it never got bombed. And I don't know if that's because the Germans knew it was well built, it would survive, or the Germans just never knew it was there, because they were very secretive in building this vast complex. So when you go into it, you literally you find this sort of metal door on the side, and uh, you have to walk along this very, very long tunnel to get in. It's sort of a couple of hundred metres. And after a couple of metres, you see on the left-hand side, you see a series of these holes, and these are the actual ways to get into the oil tank. So these were built not only to be bomb-proof, but to withstand a large amount of oil. So this wall you have to get through is eight foot thick. I suppose I should put that in, 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 in metric, what, 2.4 metres, something like that, thick. Um, and so there were no doors. The way that people used to get in and out was down the pipes. These were ventilation and, and service pipes. And how you get in is you can see... There's this metal trolley with these torches on. It's about four foot long. You lie on that and you get delivered in like a pizza being shoved into the oven is how you actually get in. Um, when I visited last, um, there was someone there who had, in the first time I went, had got halfway down and shouted blue murder and had to be pulled back out again. So if you're claustrophobic, it's not to be recommended. It's not very pleasant. Um, but on the other side, that's what it looks like. Um, well, when I say that's what it looks like, if you visit it, it looks absolutely nothing like that because this is quarter of a kilometre long. You cannot see the end wall. This is a very long exposure camera shot with torchlight in there. The only time I've seen this popular is I went the second time with a camera crew and then they had lots of lights up and you could see it. But normally what you do is you have a, you know, a torch and you can't see that. You look up and you think, oh, there's a ceiling maybe up there, the walls oh, vaguely over there. Uh, gloom everywhere else. You can't really see it. But this is what it looks like if you actually have it properly lit. Um, and it's what it, the metal work you can see lying around is the pipe work used to heat the oil. So shipping oil had to go down the hill. Shipping oil is viscous, so they had to warm it up a bit. Uh, also, these are all puddles. It's supposedly clean. I can tell you it isn't um, very clean, but it's, it's cleaner than it was. And when you go in, you have to have air quality monitoring on and stuff, such like. So I, I periodically, every few weeks, I get asked by people, can I go and visit? The answer is no, it's not actually very convenient. Um, I was very lucky to get access. So it has the most amazing acoustic. And I, when I went to visit it first, I went to visit it to prove it had a world record. Now, so what did I do? I measured according to the standard ISO 3382. You know the one which does for open plan offices? I used that. The only problem was it said, put the source and receiver in normal positions. <laughs> there we go. So there was a few, there was a few, um, few, other, few things I had to sort of kind of uh, do. And I had to have a few arguments with Guinness about the method as well. But anyway, that's another story. So I'll play you the gunshot. There's no power in here, so we use gunshot to make the measurement. Having found out that the f flame point of the oil was high enough, it wasn't going to explode when we used the gun. Um, and I'm going to play you. For those who haven't heard this recording, you can maybe play Guess the Reverberation Time.
It's got to five minutes. It's actually to wrap up soon. <laughs> uh, this recording, I will leave it to rumble on. I mean, uh, in, in the actual place where its background noise level is below their threshold of hearing, this recording is over a minute long. So let's not just spend all time listening to it because it's dropped into the background. of the. And also it depends how much bass is there because it's a very bassy, uh, um, bass reproduction in the room there is. Any ideas of the reverberation time? People haven't guessed it before. Go on, someone shout a number out. Sorry? 45 seconds. Getting close. Pardon? 30. Uh, we could get into it. I don't know if you had it in uh, We used to have something called uh, a game show, higher and lower. I can't remember what that game show was called. Anyway, let's go. We'll go through. The actual reverberation time, just to take you out of your misery, is, f is 75 seconds broadband. Um, we'll see it in a moment. So the impulse response looks like a normal impulse response, except for the scale is ridiculous because it says 70 seconds along there. For those who are acousticians, it's incredibly diffuse. When you stand in there, what you do is you get this wave of, you know, you get this sort of kind of tsunami of kind of sound go past you. It hits the back wall because it is a bit of a tunnel, and you hear that, and then everything is just a smog around you. There's nothing else. So the Schroeder's curve is beautifully, uh, is beautifully uh, diffuse, and there's no problem in background noise in that place for measurement at all. Um, here's the reverberation time. So the yellow one is the one, the old world record holder, and these are the new numbers. Um, what I think is noticeable, I had an argument with Guinness about how to, what number to use in the world record. I wanted to use this one, which is obviously nearly two minutes, 125 hertz. But they wanted a broadband number. I was a bit disappointed at that. Because how do you get a broadband number out of that? Anyway, I did something, got 75 seconds. Uh, it's a story for another day. Um, so yeah, I rather broke the record. And people say, oh, I wonder if we can break that. I suspect not, because it was made bomb-proof. So it was made half a metre thick concrete tunnelled out of rock and uh, it's just such a large space. Why would you, you might have a bomb-proof, nuclear-proof, nuclear bomb-proof place, but you'd never have such a large place. You'd have it all sectioned off into offices, unless you like very open plan offices in your nuclear bunkers. Um, so I don't think that's very likely to get broken in the near future. Um, what's kind of interesting, and I just wanted to show you this graph quickly, which I did later on after, after this, is I did a, a paper in JARSA about this. And there's three lines, you don't have to worry too much about them. But the black is my, um, my measurement. The red is the longest possible reverberation time you could get in that volume room if it was completely hard-walled. There's always a limit because of viscous losses at the edges. And you can see the actual is almost as reverberant as you could possibly have in the perfect space. So it's, it's, it's unlikely. You'd have to find a very much bigger room if you want to try and break the record and defeat it. There you are. There's a certificate, which uh, shows you my number. 75 seconds. And uh, I thought I'd just finish quickly because I'm looking at the time. And uh, I got, went back there for Channel 5 and uh, they got me to play the saxophone. So that was quite fun. And uh, uh, here is me playing the saxophone. I'll play you a little bit of the music. This is a recording done on a mobile phone. I don't have a proper recording of this, unfortunately. Um, and so you'll hear this footsteps on because this was being me playing while they were just taking pictures. They weren't recording it for proper sound. So apologies about the footsteps and the voice in it, but you can still hear this amazing sound where you get this smog of previous notes building up. So my last, last thought to you is, is this the, acoustically, the most acoustically perfect building in the world or is it an acoustic defect? <laughs>